Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Decision Hour. I'm your host, Adam Bird, and I'm, uh, yeah, stoked. Stoked because I got my buddy uh, coming on this uh, episode, and I got a question out there. How do you how do you fight like the, you know, you, you hear about this uh, climate change? How do how do we com how do we combat that? Well, sit tight, grab a pen. You're gonna want to write this shit down because this is this is something something serious. I got my buddy AJ Richards. He's no no stranger to this show. He's been on before, and uh, AJ is has been a good friend for many many years, and uh, he never ceases to amaze me. He's always got something cool going on, and you always see him doing some cool shit. And uh, the last couple of years. Shocker, he's been doing something really cool, and we're going to talk about it uh, today and and answer that question, how to combat climate change. So without further ado, AJ, what's up, bro? What's up, man? Thanks for that introduction. <laughs> Good to see you, brother. You too, man. You too. So listen, it's been a hot minute since we had you on. Why yep. don't we, let's let's get the listeners caught up a little bit. Where yep. are you and, and what are you doing? Well, right now I'm sitting in a fifth wheel in Cody, Wyoming. We're, uh, we uh, moved out here about six months ago. We bought a home that was partially finished on about seven acres. Um, and so we're finishing it after work while doing work, which is, uh, we, uh, operate and run a USDA meat processing plant in Cody, Wyoming. Okay. Um, we, Bought this company. My partners bought this company in February of this year. It was up for sale. You know, it's, it's all fortuitous how this came about. Um, but, but, uh, I guess, uh, to get the listeners started, we bought it so that we could vertically integrate the food supply chain, fix and correct this food sovereignty that we're lacking in our country because of all of the globalization that we've pursued over the last few decades, which we know is not lasting. It's not sustainable, especially with all these conflicts and stuff around the globe. Um, so we're here to to uh, right some wrongs, to create food stability and security within the country, but also to promote regenerative agriculture, holistic management as a way of doing agriculture so that we can affect in the in a positive way right. the climate change that we're experiencing. Now, one thing I want to say about the, the term climate change, because it gets politicized on both sides, but unfortunately, it's got this negative connotation like, you know, th- um, that it's bullshit yeah, or that it's just being used to scare people. And the reality is there is a climate change happening. I don't believe for a second that the way to solve that is to everybody drive EOVs because you and I both know that's a bunch of bullshit, you know, EOVs powered by coal. Um, but I do believe there's a world that makes sense where there's a balance of the two. Uh, 100% agree with you on that. And there's so many things that I want to rifle off <laughs> because, because you said that. So yeah. as you guys know, that the, I'm also, you know, with, with Heroes Media Group, we have a lot of other shows. There's another show on the network right now called Environmentally Friendly. It's a, it's a, it's based out of Rhode Island. Uh, Marissa Desitel is the, is the attorney up there. And, and a lot of the stuff they talk about is kind of geared more towards that region. However, it, everything they talk about, you can grab and, and use it in your local area. Now, why is that important? Because, couple episodes ago, she said, just because it's environmentally friendly doesn't mean it's environmentally friendly. And I was really shocked because you listen to the episodes. She's very like, she's very heavily into um, environmentally friendly things as well as conservation, which I totally agree with on, on that side of the aisle and and, and stuff. Um, But when they were talking about uh, like, I, I consulted years and God, we're talking well, we don't need to know how long ago it was, but it was a long time ago. I consulted for a solar panel company. And one of the things about solar panel is that probably most of you may or may not know is that they only have a lifespan of about 25, 30 years. So what do you do with that solar panel? A lot of the times it's there's toxic stuff in it and it costs more to dig out the stuff that you can recycle than it is just to get rid of it. 
So again, the re- the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I agree with you when you, when you say that we can use both sides. Mm-hmm. Uh, there there is a place for solar, but we have to be smart about. It. There's a place for wind, Al- although that one there kind of rubs me a little bit the wrong way because they have a lifespan and then they can't do anything with those big wind farms. So area. <laughs> which which is odd to me because you would think like you know these these little computers that we hold in our hands every day and talk to people like there's more technology in this than when we sent somebody to the moon. You can't tell me we can't figure out how to make these wind turbines turbines like recyclable or or reusable or something. So I I totally get what you're saying there and it, and and I I can't help but think you know the old windmill. I know you know what I'm talking about. The windmills with the water pumps. Yep. Uh, is it, I mean, it it it's great. So that being said, I'll get off my soapbox here <laughs> because you you you're talking about both. So keep keep going with the with the climate change mm-hmm. thing because I I, I I I totally agree. It gets politicized. Yeah. Way too much. Yeah. If I mean, if we just look at. Just look. Yeah. Right. Don't read something. Go out and look. I mean, you can read all you want, but we live in an age. It's the information age, which has caused so many problems. Right. Because everybody had a voice, whether it was an educated voice or not. Right. And I'm not I don't know that really what my stance is on that other than if you go out and look and just pay attention, you'll see that we have less rainfall in a cyclical matter than we used to. We've in, in certain areas, actually. Right. Got significant amounts of more rainfall in other areas than they're used to. Right. So we have major flooding in some region, complete droughts in other region, and everything is shifting. Right. Yeah. That is, let's take the word, that is climate changing. Right. Remove all the politics, you know, the definition that follows with the politics side, that is climate and change. Now, whether or not we get to see whether that's a good or bad thing down the road, things are shifting. Right. But what we do know is that through properly managed livestock or ruminating animals, we can restore deserts to grasslands that once were. So basically, you have to kind of go back and say, okay, before humans stepped in and put our egos in place, what did nature operate on? What was that cycle? Yeah. So I hear what you're saying, but when you say like desert, now you and I, we knew each other from our days in Arizona. And I I think about some of the remote areas down there where, yeah. and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we, we've seen livestock down there in, in certain areas mm-hmm. of Arizona and whatnot, and you can, you can raise cattle and stuff down there, but is that, is places like Arizona, Southern California, or even like, let's take Vegas for an example. It, are those all areas that could really, that you could really regenerate and, and make things grow? Absolutely. That I'm so glad you asked that because if you look up a gentleman by the name of Alejandro Carrillo, okay, just had to. I've been sort of studying him and following him for a few years, but I just had a chance to meet him in person about a month ago. He came up here to Cody and was doing some uh, agricultural training for ranchers up in this area because Cody, you know, th- this environment up here, we only average about 11 inches of rain a year. That's not a that's not a ton. No, but he's from the Chihuahua Desert. They get six. You should see this guy's property. Really? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. He's got these photos of the fence line down his property, his on one side and his neighbor on the other. Lush grass on one side, bare ground, desert on the other side. So I'm, I'm going to get political. I'm going to ask the, the question. Yeah. What's yeah. what's stopping us from doing it? Politics. So it's decision makers. I mean, look. Is there is, are they not seeing money that can be made into this? Because I I would I mean you and I are business guys. I mean I would think that money could be made from hey you know what Vegas is turning into a you know a, a hole and and we need if you put more vegetation out there that's gonna but but then again it it doesn't get a lot of water Arizona you know Lake Powell is is down a significant amount over the last twenty years. But then I then I get to thinking. You mentioned the rain thing. I get to thinking like, wait a minute, we've literally have learned how to like control some, and not to get conspiracy theory, but but it's been shown that you know they can make it rain in certain areas if they wanted to. Why don't they? Well, they do. 
we don't know the long term consequence of that, but right. like they're shooting iodized iodine basically into the clouds to accumulate rain and create rain natural uh, uh, man made not man made they're pulling the right. moisture into located concentrated areas through these this iodized system that they have but we don't know does that pull from other areas that it should have been naturally but to answer your question there is money to be made but it's not the old money uh, the old money is in power yeah right the old money is the herbicides the pesticides the insecticides the fertilizers that's the old money they don't make money when people adopt these actual natural processes they lose the matter of fact they go away so who's fighting it who's funding it what who's who's lobbying and creating special interest groups the ones that are making money off the current old system right see until they unless they switch over which they won't they die they go away when you find out that you don't need fertilizer that whole system breaks and goes away. Who's the largest fertilizer corporation in the world? Monsanto. Ooh. Yeah. Also owned, also combined with Bayer. They're the same company. Yeah. Oh, really? They, oh, yeah. And they stand to lose a shit ton of money because also what happens under holistic thinking. I'm not talking about holistic management as just land, but every thought you make is done in a holistic approach. Like if I do this, here's the trickle down effect. I'm going to make my decisions holistically because that's how life works. If you remove one part of the whole, you break the whole system. Right. But when you operate holistically, you don't need pharmaceuticals. You don't need fertilizers. You don't need insecticides. You don't need herbicides. You don't need pesticides. Who loses? So, <laughs> Suppression. There's of a, and there's topic. so many topics that we can just oh, go off on that. On <laughs> Folks, I'm laughing because it's like, you've, like you, you've heard other episodes with AJ on and him and I can just, that's why I love talking with him because <laughs> it's, it's, always, it's always like, dude, right? <laughs> like, yep, yep. Um, yep. But no, that's the reality. Yeah. There is yeah. money to be made, but not for the big guys because they're making trillions, billions. It's, but it's a complete reshifting of everything they've been doing. And and look, when I say this, Monsanto, Bayer, the, the they, when people say, well, who's they? At this point, a corporation is so large that even the, the guy who's appointed to sit at the head of that organization has no decision-making power. Right. It's, it's almost an AI. Right. Making its own decisions based off of what? Shareholder right. returns. So, okay. So, what, how do you change it then? How do you, how do how do we how do we make a difference? What can what One can we do? One farm and ranch at a time. One farmer and rancher at a time. Yeah, and I'm See, and I'm those- and I'm glad I'm glad you said it like that because like, like you got me into back into like the gardens like growing up in Wisconsin like my and I was just up there my grandparents they got you know I, I literally stand in our raspberry patch and I just, I'll eat breakfast in the morning out picking raspberries. I like doing stuff like that. I miss doing stuff like that. And I'm I'm gonna throw AJ here under the but AJ got me back into um like he got me into this like this hydroponic uh, you know the with the, the tree the, towers, the, yeah. the towers and stuff. And I freaking love mine. Like it's it's there's there's you look at it right now, there's a ton of stuff on it. Um and then from there I was like, wait a minute, there's something to this. So I went out and I bought like twelve it started off as is eight different um five gallon buckets. All right. Now how can I do is I'm going to learn to do it from the dirt. So when I get land in myself, I know what I'm doing. So I got raspberries outside of my porch. I got, uh, uh, spaghetti squash, watermelon. You know, I got all of these, I, I'm growing a pineapple tree, you know, just because I wanted to try it. Yeah. All nice. different uh, tomatoes. I got all different t- types of stuff. And that was because of this guy right here that got me back into to doing that. And then I see him doing, what he's doing now with the, with the agriculture, I honestly think, and you and I are about the same age. I really think this is something that should be taught in schools, and 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 I'm not just saying in certain areas. It should be taught in all the schools. Do they teach this up there with uh, uh, at the schools up there? No, and you know part of the problem is is the, the internet has changed our ability to access information sooner than it was disseminated, right? But but it used to be that when they discovered something new, 
it took roughly 40, like, let's say it's a medical advancement, something new. It took roughly 40 years be before that became the way we did it. Right. Because once they discovered it, you know, out in the real world, that had to be documented and recorded and proven. And then it had to be passed on to the universities that taught those certain, you know, whatever, whatever field we're discussing. Right. And then once they taught it, then it took those new people learning it to go out and implement it, right? So it just took time right. before we even knew that, the, hey, did you know you can do this now and it works? So there's just this significant lack of knowledge so far. It's changing rapidly because of the internet, right. because of, you know, for all of its good and bad, you got things like net, places like Netflix that anybody with a wad of cash and a camera can go create a documentary and all of a sudden it becomes gospel, right? So there's the good and the bad, but you got places like Netflix, you'd create a really good show, whether you know actually what the hell you're talking about or not, they might pick it up if it's well written, well produced. <laughs> right. Well, fortunately in 2020, there was a documentary released. It was the number one documentary of the year, I believe, on Netflix called Kiss the Ground. And Kiss the Ground did a absolutely phenomenal job of Painting the picture about where we're at, but didn't just leave you hanging like we're all just screwed anyway. Good luck. Right. They followed it through and followed these people from an organization called Understanding Ag. Okay. <clears throat> they consult around the country and the world on how to go regenerative on your farm or ranch. And so they were able to complete that documentary with actual evidence of what's possible. And I'll tell you. Up until that documentary, I had just written off my children's future as environmental refugees, just like I've seen personally in countries like Iraq. Yeah. No water, no food. They were lucky if we rolled through in our Humvees to give and, them what we and had. and you and you yeah and you think about that that's a biblical time that's a yep. bi very biblical area right. Yep. And, and it used you, to be the cradle of life. Yeah, and and you think about the Garden of Eden and everything else that that all stemmed from that region. Yeah. So I met a guy. No, go ahead. Oh yeah, a little little side side kind of tangent just to show the impact that human beings have on a vast area of land. Yeah. Went back to Iraq, 2010. Private security company decided it wasn't for me. I was there more for the money than the cause, and so it was time to go home. I'm sitting in the Baghdad International Airport. Um, waiting for my flight to leave, and I end up sitting next to a gentleman who was the head of General Electric for the entire country, a local from Iraq, whole his whole life. End up having this conversation with him. He told me that Iraq was never a desert until Saddam. Iraq Ooh. was primarily, and check it out, it's it's amazing. Pri Iraq was primarily a wetland, the entire country. There's an entire culture that's been completely erased off of the planet that. They floated around these wetlands on villages tied together with the reeds, mm -hmm. and they lived off the fish and stuff like that in the wetlands. When Saddam took power, he did not like the ability to see as far as he could right. because he was afraid of Kuwait. So one man made the decision to dam off and change the route of all of the canals and, and waterways that rolled through the desert of Iraq, and it dried up. Now, you know what happens when you have a dry, formerly wet ground that is dry? You got that crust on the top? Yep. Iraq also never had haboobs until Desert Storm. Because when we went on Desert Storm and our tanks and Humvees and everything rolled over the crust and broke it up, it exposed the soft powdery soil under that crust. And now when the wind blew, oh, it created yeah. haboobs. They... One man completely changed an entire global region and everything else around it because of his decision. We are seeing the exact same thing globally because of how agriculture was taught after World War II. So in World War II, right. um, uh, we had all of these chemicals for war. Right. A surplus. Right. And we discovered, wait a minute, we can alter these slightly and uh, turn it into fertilizer and look what happens. And that was the Green Revolution. But we had no clue the long-term impact of fertilizer on – all we knew was like, man, we just quadrupled our yield. This must be good for us. 
I, wow. We had no idea that we were that. killing the microorganisms in the soil that were responsible for sustainable food. That's that's mind blowing. I didn't even think about the, you bringing up World War II and then altering weapons, turning it into fertilizer. Because I I've just started dabbing in fertilizer, like home remedies stuff, like yeah, egg whites or uh, you know, I, m- most people know I own a, a coffee business, so we'll take like the coffee grounds. After you make a pot of coffee, we save here in this in, in our house. We don't get rid of the, after we make a pot of coffee, we don't get rid of the grounds. We, I put them in a mason jar or I put them in mason jars and, and then I'll mix that stuff with, now that's, I mean, you're not going to do that. You know, I'm thinking of my, my families up in Wisconsin that have, you know, thousands of acres and stuff. That's not going to suffice. So that's a lot of coffee, but, um, you know uh, what your family does if they've got that amount of land is they find a rancher and they partner with that rancher or they become ag- uh, uh, livestock people themselves. That's Yeah, that's what we do. And then they s- graze them in controlled cells yep. across the property so they can leave their own manure and now, leave them behind. So, so let me ask you this. How long does that take then when – well, you know what? Let me, let, me, let me stop there for a second. Let me, let me back up. Sure. Yeah. AJ, you're the president of Wyoming – Legacy meats, and we're talking about regenerative, like pastures and stuff like that. For those that are listening right now, how can if they got questions for you, or how can the you know first off, how did how can people reach you and learn more? Uh, social media okay. is one way because I'm <clears throat> I've been uh, I hate social media because it takes a lot of my time, but I also know that's the best platform to get information out there. So. <clears throat> On TikTok, we have, and I hate TikTok, but it's where the people are. I hate it because, and I was, I had this, I had this deep internal personal debate knowing where that information's going, but I'm like, you know what? If China's taking my information about regenerative agriculture, then at least they're getting some good shit out of right. this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not selling, I'm not selling any, right. you know, sharing any government right. secrets, but I am sharing regenerative agriculture. Yeah. But anyway. All that to be said, I share as much as I can on TikTok and Instagram, okay. and I do my daily chores. And when I'm doing those, I'm talking about why my goats are so good for the woody objects and how they're turning that back into grass, or you know how we're using the the, the manure. You know, I've got old videos on there where I had cows, and I'm, you know, probably the most enthusiastic guy to be picking up a piece of shit and showing all the bugs inside of it. You know, and like. The, the layman might be like, this dude's nuts, but I'm like, look at this, you know, but that's the best way. And, and, uh, and TikTok, it's Homestead Pastures at Homestead Pastures. And then on Instagram, I'll have to look at it because I actually don't even know my own Instagram. I mean, you can look up AJ Richards, but I believe it's, uh, uh, let's see. It is a period J underscore Richards. So I use my social media to try to help, you know, educate and advance that information. So that's one way, um, you know, shoot me a message there and I'll, I'll engage. So go on there and I'm happy to. And, and he will, folks, he will. Like anytime I get a, if I get a ding or I happen to be looking at it and he, I see him on, I usually try to go on and hear what he's, what he's saying. The other night with the goats was yeah. freaking hilarious. Um, yeah. All right. So he, here's a question for you. You're out. Okay. What type of animals, is there certain animals that you're supposed to use that are better than others when you're doing regenerative agriculture? All ruminating animals. <clears throat> ruminating animals. It's the rumen. I don't know yet exactly the definition of that, but it's the rumen. Basically, they're eating vegetation and it's fertilizer coming out the rear end. So okay. ruminating animals. Goats, so like sheep, go- cows. Bison. Uh, bison, yak, water buffalo. Uh, any sort of mammalian type animal like that around the globe um, to, to an extent, you know? Uh, okay, so here's another question for you then. I'm going to, I'm going to use the example of Arizona or, 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 or even Vegas because we're yeah. familiar with those areas Yep. or even Southern Utah, parts of Southern Utah too. Yep. You got a lot of desert area out there. 
not much vegetation for the animals to feed from. Yep. How do you, how, what's the process, that, what's the thought process going into that? You look at this, it's very barren, not much vegetation here to eat. Can my animals survive on this or can we till this up and have them move around so we can, this in a couple of years, we'll start growing again. What Walk yeah. us through that thought process. Yeah, so you have to have water okay. and you have to have some food. And so if you're in a degraded enough area where there's neither, you will you do have to do the work to bring it in. It's a long-term investment because we took out of it without considering that. Right. Now, what will happen is, so there's a gentleman, I can't remember his name, but he's in northern Arizona. And he's been working on these projects where he'll go to gravel pits, like the, the, the tailings of gravel pits. Yeah. So there's there's nothing. It's literally just rocks. Right. They'll roll out bales of hay and rotate livestock on those on those tailing piles, and a year later grass is growing. No kidding. And it's just tailings. Now, uh, you asked a, a question a second ago um, that was along the lines of um, I'm trying to think what you asked. Uh, well, let me keep going with this so I don't lose that train of thought. I'm, my ADD brain's like, oh, there's so many things to talk about. Um, so, yes, you have to have water, you have to have feed source, but once you get it going, you're, you start a compounding effect. Right. And it's going to take time. Now, you oh, the question you asked earlier, how much time? Yeah. Five years. Five years? What we took a hundred plus years to destroy from Mother Nature, Mother Nature will take back in five if we support her. Now, that's if you have water. Have and, water, and, have and, and you bring food, and and a lot of the times in situations that you know, I'm I'm kind of using extreme areas. I think it would be safe yep. to say, and that and you should, yeah, you know, because it, I, I, and I'm doing that because I want to paint the picture for you listeners out there that you you know you think of you know Vegas, Sin City area, Arizona, the very you know uh, southern Utah area, very very barren areas in in a lot of those areas, particularly in in, in Nevada. And if you can get hay or, or, or food out to these areas and then you, you bring in water, as AG said, it, it's, it, it's not a cheap thing. It's a long-term investment, but will it pay off? If you're looking at, a, a like AJ said, a five-year to 10-year plan, I would probably go as far as to say 10-year because the five years when it's really starting to just start to come back in, in, a, in a bigger area. But... 10 years down the road, is it going to be worth it? Oh, absolutely. Because now you got an area that this was desert and now it's this lush green, you know, and, yeah. and, and I, and here, I can't help but to think that we should be, we're responsible to do, if we're, if we're, if we're landowners, we should be do, doing this. And and I'm the type of guy, and, and you know me, AJ, like I'm the type where, you know, we I'm, I'm big in conservation, so we my family hunts and we fish, and and we are very strong believers of using everything that you possibly can of that animal when you dispatch it, right? Yep. So and that's that's what we, uh, that's what I believe, and I I I want to get more into this. Where it's like, okay, if I get some land, and then. Now I'm not worried about all oh, the yard sucks. Is there's all the kinds of I don't have to you know I got I got to lay a bunch of sod down. Eh, maybe I don't have to. I want to get some animals, get the animals, get them out there, have them feed them, and a year later, it's the grass starts growing back, and eventually it's just going to keep going. A year after year, it's going to get better and better. At, at least that's yep. my thought process on that. Because then you think, okay, now you have you've created your own ecosystem at your house, right? You have That's right. food, you have water, um, you have vegetation for your for your animals, which eventually will become part of your food because that's let's face it, folks, that that's the process that we that we go through, right? And then that just keeps recycling. The animals have more animals, and then you do this and that, and then it just so now all of a sudden, what are what's AJ talking about? He's talking about saving, eventually saving you guys a ton of money, and you're making you self sufficient, where you're not relying yeah. on going to the grocery store and like, oh no, there's no meat on in, in the stores, or there's no, 
you know, pick something. Yeah. You know, there's Which, no, the there's way, no milk or, you know, I'm tired yeah. of paying $5. Yeah. You know, I remember as a, in high school long ago, a buddy of mine was from Hawaii and this was in the late nineties and they were paying $5 a gallon. And that was back then. What are we seeing that. now? About five dollars a gallon. When when just as short as four years ago, it was like two fifty for a gallon. So yeah. it's like, yeah, and, well, and, you know, one of the things you to add on to an earlier question about what do we do? Yeah, policy change, but the everyday American can't affect that really. However, they can where they spend their money. Right. Where they spend their money has a significant impact on how things develop. So then the counter to that or the argument to that is, well, eating this healthy meat's too expensive. And I contest, look at everything you're spending your money on, and I guarantee you that's bullshit. So would you encourage people? Yeah, go ahead. If you buy a candy bar for $1.50 for the weight of that candy bar, and you compare it to a one pound regeneratively raised, I'm going to use air quotes if you're listening and not watching, expensive steak. It's like $13 a pound for the candy bar. You just. Dude, spent- it totally just blew. I've never even looked at it that way. Yeah. You, God, you, I feel you, guilty. About, it's Thanks. cheap. It's only about 50. Bullshit. <laughs> Pound, and and by the way, you ate something that's causing more of a negative impact on right. you, and you're still hungry. Right. You're still void of nutrition. Yeah, it's not more expensive. Now that's not even taken into consideration since we're all short sighted and we don't consider the long term health impacts and what it's going to cost us when we're fifty, sixty, seventy. Yeah, you're going to spend way more money not eating healthy down the road. So the counter to well, I don't have any money right now. Well, yeah, you do. How much beer did you buy? How many candy bars yeah. did you buy? Where what are you spending I, money on? I'll, I'll say this: one of the best decisions I've ever made this year was I went halves on a, on a cow with my, yep. my brother. We did uh so we each got a quarter nice. and uh, I drove back to Wisconsin cause it was local to my brother where he, where he's at. And uh, it was a funny story real quick. So we, we ordered it back in, which was last, I don't know, October and we were supposed to pick it up this year this this january the guys that we never got your order it was like we we see that we ordered but we lost your order the guy felt so bad that he did it overnight and we each got like extra steaks extra ground beef and, and stuff like that now i i took an entire cooler and i drove 15 hours with all of this you know with with over there was easily over 200 pounds of of beef and that was the best decision. And it was like, it was like 600. It was about my, my side of it was about 600 bucks. I think it was like, we paid like 1400 bucks, yep, but that's right. That's the best $600 because I got over 80 pounds of just ground. Yep. That wasn't including all the steaks or the roast or anything else. Just, just the ground side of it, 80 pounds of ground. You can't go any at any store in America and find ground beef a pound for less than, you know, Four eighty five five dollars in most places. Yep. And I paid six hundred bucks, and I got over two hundred pounds of meat. Do the math on that. It was it averaged out to like three dollars and nineteen cents a pound for beef. You you can't find that anywhere. No, nope. and know. you bought it from somebody who's actually going to turn around and yep. keep managing the land the right way. Yep. You know where it came from. You know the animal was taken yep. care of. And if they're no GMO, none none of that yep. stuff. It was all grass fed. And oh yeah. Smartest wow. decision, and, and I say this, folks, because if you're listening, I want you guys to think about doing something like that. Like everybody's like, yeah, yeah. Is it convenient to go to the grocery store? Absolutely. I'm not going to argue that fact. But if you want to save money, and you want something that's really good for you, I, yep. I you know, I, I live out in Pennsylvania, and we got like the Amish and stuff. Like that. There's a pig farm. I've already talked with those. Uh, farmers out there and got our order for next year. I'm doing an entire hog next year. Um, we're looking at uh, local areas for beef and, and and stuff out here. I don't have to, but like I'm I'm only halfway through what I the beef that I got earlier this year. I'll sit on that until the end of the year and still have stuff left over. It's like, yep. what do you have to do? Buy a generator, a couple of freezers, 
you know, sit back and, relax. and that's if you don't have your own animals and, and, and stuff okay. like that. You know what I mean? Otherwise, go buy land, get get some animals. Homestead. Yeah. And and and, and be self sufficient. Yeah. That's my like to me, I think that's the American dream. Yeah. I well, I think it's gonna be the American luxury soon. In other words, uh let me rephrase that. It'll it, it could be the American requirement. Yeah. Um, you know, we are dealing with some major changes in the supply chain. This is not yeah. conspiracy theory or fear. Look at 2020. Yeah. 2020, store shelves are empty. Well, you, you know, I, and I was going to bring that up. I'm glad you did. So let's talk about that for a minute. Store shelves are, from, and I, I saw somewhere, I heard somewhere that, like, we supply the world, like, one third of the food that, that goes out, something something like that. Yeah. I, and I may be wrong on that, on that, that figure, but. But that that blew my mind because it's like I, I feel like wait a minute we're importing food like meats and stuff from like China or or you know uh, Russia and these other places and stuff like that and I'm like why are we exporting food like how come we're not doing stuff here first that and 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 then doing that because you would you would think common sense I'll hold my breath on that one. Yeah, that that we would like once we get established here and we're doing we're we're doing well so well here that then we can share with the rest of the world. Like, but let's get what we need here first. Do, well, yeah, does that make sense? Oh yeah, well and yeah, that that's the problem. It isn't common. It makes sense, but that's not common. So let's talk about some 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 numbers, and uh, I invite you to fact check me. And these aren't going to be precise. I'm. I'm running a lot of data in my brain these days, but this is what, what I can tell you. And you, when you find it, you'll say, oh yeah, he, he was, he was close, yeah. you know, horseshoes, hand grenades and AJ's numbers. <laughs> those all are in the same field. Um, <clears throat> we export roughly the same amount of beef that we import. And then you're telling me. And I'm me willing to bet we lose money doing it. Well, and you're also telling me it's the cow farts that are the problem with our environment. Make you choke on your coffee. One, one, literally one oil tanker shipping, shipping container right. or ship, yeah. right, is equivalent to 40,000 cars on the highway. So if we are shipping yeah. the same amount of beef in that we're sending out, where's the real emissions problem in the agriculture industry? Yeah, it's in shipping and stuff. We're wasting. Well, it's we're wasting money. We're wasting resources. And consider the resources it takes to manufacture fertilizers to grow our food. So there's a saying amongst the regenerative community: it is not the cow; it's the how. That's it's so not true. the cow; yeah. it's the how. Yeah. Um, I had to write that down. Thanks. Yeah. Now, some other some other sort of numbers. We waste in America 40% of the food that we produce. Let's just take one location since we keep talking about Nevada. Yeah. Think about all of those buffets on the Las Vegas Strip. The amount of food they're throwing out. And many of those places have regulations where they can't even give that food to the hungry or the homeless. Because if they do and a homeless person gets sick and then they sue the place they got it from. So it's literally going to the landfill or in some cases they'll send it off to like a pig, a pig farm to get, to get, uh, fed to the pigs, but it's wasted 40%. And yet the argument amongst those trying to fight for, I'll use the term big ag, the, the big corporations. Uh, the argument is that we don't have the ability to raise enough food regeneratively to feed the population bullshit yeah that, that's hard for me to believe right yeah. i'm pretty sure we have enough I'm, I'm sure we have enough cows or, or sheep goats yeah i mean buffalo I mean, shit ted turner owns the largest buffalo herd and yeah in all the world and i mean it, and that supplies all of his restaurants and stuff like that you would think yep yeah. but they want to promote eating bugs and fake meat so, 
maybe that hasn't come across many of your listeners' no. desk. Yeah. But that's legitimately what they're trying to, to promote. Bugs and fake meat. Now, I'm not going to go into it all, but if you look at the energy cost to manufacture fake meat. So, again, it's not the cow, it's the how, and we're trying to find all these other ways around it, but really all those other ways are just driven by profit. And again, the, the, the they is not one individual person, per se, right? unless we're talking about Klaus Schwab, but otherwise it's... Sorry, I keep throwing these like... Not a sponsor, so we're good. <laughs> yeah, name, name dropping these conspiracies out there, but but I mean, just follow the money. Follow the money. Right. You'll, you'll, you'll have the reality. Right now, the money is not in the small agricultural person trying to rotate their cattle regeneratively every day to en enhance and improve the soil on their property. Not yet, but it's growing. Do so, you, mm -hmm. do, when, and this has always been the case, right? This started, you said earlier, that started kind of back in World War II, how they started this process back then. And I, and I, I get to thinking, I remember when the, what we called up in the Midwest, the mega farms started yes. coming in and started taking over and, and paying farmers to not do dairy you know, the mega dairy farms, like I, I got an uncle that he still does crops uh, and, and corn because there's a big ethanol plant not far, so they'll they'll do that. And he's got some some steers that he does in one of the fields, and so he rotates those those cows and stuff like that. But then I got the thing, and I was like, man, I remember as a kid, I used to help him milk, you know. And then these mega farms came in, yeah. and they bought out all the cattle, and they're doing it. so. It's making it's all kind of clicking. Yeah. No. Well, and and then uh, uh, Reagan, Reagan or Richard Nixon, they lifted the control. I think it was Reagan over the size that a company could get. Or you know, I, again, these are not. This is not my specialty. I know enough to point people in the right direction. But right. prior to the 1980s, there was basically limitations on how big a company could get. Well, those were lifted and that's why we have the big four processors. So four processing companies control 85% of the meat market in the United States. Four so it's a monopoly. It's a monopoly. And what they'll do Although is, you ask them, they're like, well, monopolies are illegal. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. So what they do is they buy up the little guy. Somebody starts making an impact and momentum. They buy it and white label it. I mean, in the craft, I'm going to use a, an example, but a, a simple one. In the craft beer world, anybody gets momentum, they get bought out by the big guy. And now there's now it's all run under these individual brands, but right. they're all owned yeah. by one particular company. In addition to that, the, the, the Green Revolution, Richard Nixon said, get big or get out. Or Gerald Ford. I can't remember. Gerald Ford. 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 When they implemented, and that was specifically to promote going away from sustainable or the, the methods that our great grandparents used to right. feed their family. They had all these chemicals that they needed to use. They were converting them into fertilizers. And that whole green revolution campaign was get big or get out. So when you talk about those big farms, that's where they came from. I'll look that up. Get big or get out. You know, I'll tell you, being in this industry, there's a couple of unique things that have showed up where none of this is any is conjecture or theory or or bullshit anymore. The day we closed, we had a buyer from China trying to buy all of our meat and send it overseas. The day we closed, a friend of ours runs a pro, uh, owns a company in California. A Chinese company bought their processing plant, not that they didn't own it, but where they were getting their meat processed to sell to American consumers. Uh, they were asked to sell to China. They denied because they wanted to feed Americans and they just didn't have an interest in that. They cut half of their spots and doubled the cost of processing. Now, I wasn't in that conversation, so I'm not going to say they did it because they didn't sell to China, but that's what happened. Yeah, I'm seeing a theme here. If and those of you are watching any current events and and, and know, know my theory on on China and I'll I'll say this again read the 100 year mm -hmm. marathon because we're in the, we're literally in the middle of it and getting ready to start the the downward spiral of it China bought several hundred acres near a military installation up in South Dakota I think it was 
Oh, that's convenient. Yeah. So, like, if you guys don't listen. It, yeah. It, like, if you guys can't open your eyes and see what the is going on, then, then don't complain that you're sitting in a food line waiting your turn, hoping that there's enough soup to, you know, put in your bowl. And and, and that, I'm saying that is a little extreme, and I'm, and I'm doing that on purpose, but AJ here is giving you, like those of you that listen to the, that are listening to this, research this stuff. Mm-hmm. Get get involved. I I tell you the best decision I made was like, there's nothing nothing that tastes better than an, uh, a red onion that you grew yourself. Yeah. Or yeah. or uh potatoes and and ground beef that you that 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 you have because you paid for it and and, and you know where it came from. Like there's, yep. there's nothing better than growing this stuff yourself. Is it is it time consuming? A little bit. It doesn't have to be. It can be when it starts off. My problem is I'm not patient. Like I'm yeah. just like, how come this shit isn't going? Like I'm sitting there dumping <laughs> coffee grinds and mixing dirt and doing this and that. My wife gets mad at me and she's like, you got a freaking mess. You need to clean this shit up. Yeah. And I'm just like, you're not going to complain when you got these giant heads of lettuce for your salad and <laughs> you go to work, do you? No. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. and, and so I guess I'm I, I and the reason why I sound so passionate about this stuff, guys, is because I, this is something I firmly believe in. Yeah, you know, I, I and, and AJ's the same way. You know, otherwise he wouldn't be. I mean, the the guy picked his family up, moved to Cody, Wyoming, and I'll be honest with you, bro. And you know, I'm, I'm you know, yep. I was like, what the hell is he doing now? Yeah, and then yep. then he starts doing this, and I was like, wait a minute, I'm gonna sit back here and I gotta watch him because. He everything he touches is always it, it boom 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 it works and now seeing you doing this it it just it, it proves the the fact that okay how come more people aren't doing this how do we get more people involved yeah uh well first of all let me just speak to so those and most of your listeners aren't going to know me but I've had that question like what are you doing that came out of nowhere. <clears throat> the reality is that um, this has been a journey of mine forever. You met me at Rush Club. Yep. My goal at Rush Club was to be so successful that I was Dana White and his budget that I could go do this right. with that budget. Yep. I didn't share that with anybody, but that was my personal goal. So I've been, my family are fifth generation ranchers. They That's settled. Right. Yep. Yep. They settled the Arizona Strip in 1916, homesteaded it, one of the last 40, lower 48 homesteads that were made available in our country. And they went out there and we have historical writings. When they got there, grass was stirrup high, stirrup as stirrup on the saddle. Yeah. So chest high. And they could throw seeds in the ground and dry farm almost anything. And then in five years, the writings changed and said they couldn't grow anything. What they didn't understand is that they broke nature's cycle. They put up fences so that li- the, the wildlife couldn't roam as it normally did. They tilled the ground because that's what they understood, which destroyed the mice inside the soil, the, 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 uh, the fungus network in the right. soil. They, they ruined things. They didn't do it. On, they just didn't know. And so I'm watching my family's land out there degrade just since I've been alive. And so I've been invested in this for a long time. People just didn't know until my own personal development was like, man, I keep trying all these other ways to get involved. My last business failure, I had an awakening and I said, why don't you just go for the damn thing you're trying to get to anyway? Which is getting involved in agriculture. And so I called my cousin and I said, I want to sell beef for your ranch. You write, you raise it, I'll sell it. That was in 2020. Yeah, I just I was running a self development coaching um, company and working for you know helping people transform their lives and that was my own awakening. I was and that went away because 2020 people freaked out and they're like, oh, I'm keep my money close because I don't know what's coming. Right. So that went away and I'm like, shit, man, you keep trying to do all these other things to get into ag because you know it needs to be changed or made a difference. Why don't you just get into ag? And I was like, it was scary as hell, man. I because you know in the ag space. They have a joke. If you want to be a millionaire, start out with 10 million. <laughs> so 
I was operating off other people's experiences of what it was like to be an ag. And I was like, shit, I better earn a lot of money first. Um, and nobody's in ag to make a bunch of money. Nobody that's in responsible ag. Right. They're in it to be on the land, be in nature, which is why it's a lifestyle that they want. Yes. It's, it's not, it's why, not about the money. I, I, yeah. The suicide rate amongst agriculture people is very close to the suicide rate of combat veterans because they're losing their farms and ranches because they can't sustain it because we have broken the system. And when, just like you and I know as being combat vets, when you lose your identity, it's very, very difficult to see a way to go forward. And we're already talking about a population that makes up only 1% of the entire American population. 1% to 2% are in agriculture. 1% to 2% of 327 million people are trying to raise enough food for 327 million people. And they have a suicide rate similar to combat veterans right now. Let me ask you this. Here's a thought. What if we created, and maybe maybe there are classes on this. I I, I know I mentioned a show that was on the network earlier. They they uh, mentioned up in Rhode Island they do a class for kids that's run by kids. Yeah, damnedest thing, man, I've ever seen. And and I looked into it. Um, I, it brought me back to being young when you had like home ec and cooking or like woodworking classes, you know, the the classes that they don't offer in public schools anymore. This is the type of stuff. We had an agriculture class in in junior high because of the area that we lived in. And I I think it was great that they're doing it. What if, what if we created a class and, and maybe there is already, I don't know. I haven't looked, but is there a class online where people can, can take to learn how to, homestead and do do this do this for their area you know the agricultural side of things or why won't you mentioned earlier and not to get too political on it but i think we start talking to it starts at your local level if you want to make a change you got it i've always said get these bastards out of dc how do you do that how do you do that and i i got wrapped up in the emotional side of it, you have to you have to do it at a local level. You start at a local level, it will eventually trickle up and it will change. Yep. So why not create why aren't we creating stuff? Why isn't the government creating stuff? Hey, you know what? Go out and I and I knew that there was something where at least in some states that they'll pay a, a landowner to keep that land farmable or keep it I, th- I think we need more stuff like that is really what I'm trying to say. In yeah, long we do. We do. You know, there's a, so yes, online, there's a, the Savory Institute. Okay. The Savory Institute was uh, founded by a gentleman named Alan Savory from South Africa. His, his YouTube video on his Ted talk on YouTube. If you look up, if you go on YouTube and look up Alan Savory, Ted talk. Okay. I came across that. During the Rush Club days, which is what gave me like the aha moment, like, oh, wait a minute. My kids aren't just automatically doomed to to the future of where we're going. Right. His uh, his story is very compelling. And so this is a gentleman that should that, um, you know, maybe one day will be revered as the one who got us going in the right direction. He's responsible for the largest elephant uh, kill off in history because he was a manager of a park land that had these elephants and his observation was they were destroying the land. So he ordered like the killing. I, I'm going to, it was, it was thousands of animals of, of, of elephants. He said it was the worst mistake of his entire life. He'll spend the rest of his life making up for that because what immediately followed was a tremendous and rapid degradation of the environment. Yeah. What he was seeing in the beginning was they were tilling, you know, they're knocking trees over and making these big old wallows. And he's like, that's not good. And he killed him off and it desertified. And so he explains the whole process and how he's gone through to make up for that and what he's teaching. So the Savory, Alan Savory, Savory Institute has an online course about holistic management. Then there's also um, uh, the Soil Health Institute by Understanding Ag. If you look up Understanding Ag, they have some programs there as well to teach that. 
But also in, in regards to combat veterans and ag people, there's an organization called Bear Hug Cattle Company. You can find them on 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 uh, Instagram to kind of see what they're up to. Bear Hug Cattle Company. And um, they produce the next generation of veteran leaders in agriculture. Nice. And they do some close work with some friends of mine in Montana. Their ranch is called the Little Belt, Little Belt Cattle Co. So if you want to follow those guys. And so they'll bring veteran uh, interns onto the ranch and teach them how to get into ag. Now, if your concern is I don't have the money to buy the land, no problem. Because what needs to happen is go knock on the doors of these millionaire ranch owners that they don't have any intention to do anything other than have it be their own private hideout. Educate yourself really well on the impact that you can help them make on their property and why they'll be able to enjoy it more and benefit from the tax write-off as agricultural land and work out a deal where you lease the land that they are, that they own that they have no personal interest in running at livestock on. Right. It's better to control the land to own the land. Maybe. If you yeah. can own it, good for you. <laughs> but there's plenty of of land there's plenty of land out there that needs people to manage it and if you're a veteran and you're looking for that balance there's no better balance than being in nature working directly with her oh, to yeah. find that, that balance in your life so just to kind of tie that all yeah. in so yeah there are certainly organizations out there that are that are in place to make that difference aj we're coming up on time okay and, and you've you've given it a, a bunch of decision hour moments already but you know the question's coming. I got to ask. In a time in your life, your feet are on the line. You had to make that decision. What is it? What was the atmosphere like? A year and a half ago, maybe two, I'm pulling inventory off of the Walmart shelves in the distribution center in St. George, Utah. I tried and failed my second business. No, third. And fortunately, COVID protocols were in place, so we had to wear masks. So I wore one of these gator necks that covered my ears so you couldn't see. I was listening to podcasts my entire shift. And I listened to many podcasts, but one of them in particular <clears throat> was Andy Frisilla, Real AF. He's the owner of First Form Supplements. And he talks about his story, but he's also a no bullshit kind of person. And so I spent hours, you know, 12 hour shifts, just listening to podcasts because I'm pulling fucking inventory for Walmart. And also in my, in my knowing what I've been studying and all this, you know, the, the, the way we live as, as, as Americans, really thousands of square feet of bullshit We're the most wasteful society in the world, thousands and thousands. And that was just one facility out of the hundreds or thousands that they have across the country. And, uh, I was just like, man, am I just resigned to to doing this? And, you know, I work with great people that that's what they do and they don't really have a view outside of that. That's okay. But for me, it didn't sit well. So to make the decision to be bold and start talking about what I wanted to do, because I didn't think I could ever find somebody to take on this mission. And then I just started flapping my gums. And I kid you not, Within five months of starting the conversation, I was living in Cody. That was the line. And that, and you know, I just had a meeting with my staff today. You get your teeth kicked in, you get back up. You get your key, teeth kicked in, you get back up. It's like the Thomas Edison story. It took mm -hmm. him thousands of failures, but it was the combination of every single one of those failures that led to the light bulb. I love it. Love it. AJ, thanks, brother. I appreciate your time coming on and, and sharing this. The folks, you're gonna hear <laughs> you're gonna hear a lot more on this. We're gonna put up all the uh websites that, that AJ was talking about uh, in this. It'll be in the show descriptions and whatnot. And we're gonna put AJ's um social media stuff up so you guys can uh follow him there. This is an important topic. We're gonna have him on again. We'll we'll check back in with him. Uh, here in, in a few months and whatnot and uh and make sure you guys follow him too so aj again thanks brother appreciate it folks that's all the time that we have make sure you check out all the great shows over at heroes media group 
Uh, simply go to heroesmediagroup.com. Until next time, you've been listening to The Decision Hour.